Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. Today, Kelly, O'Neill, and John Ladley will discuss big data as a gateway to knowledge management. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. To open the familiar chat and Q&A panels, just go to the bottom middle to find those icons. And the Q&A can be found by clicking the icon that looks like three little dots. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DIAnalytics. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Again, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our series speakers, Kelly O'Neill and John Ladley. John is a business technology thought leader and recognized enterprise information management authority. His 30 years of experience including, include planning, project management, implementing information systems, and improving IT functions. John writes and speaks on a variety of topics and enjoys sharing his expertise on strategic planning, data governance, and practical technology applications that solve business problems. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First Fan for San Francisco Partners, an information management consulting firm. She is a veteran industry leader, speaker, author, and trainer. Kelly is passionate about helping companies leverage the value of data, empowering them to derive insights from it that inform decision-making and improve results. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelly and John to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope everyone had a wonderful Halloween yesterday, the best holiday of the year. John, did you? Um, it was the perfect kind of Halloween I like to have. And Very good. We'll leave it there. <laughs> Very good. Well, today uh, is kind of a follow-up to our September webinar, actually. And so that webinar, Advanced Databases and Knowledge Management, um, really today we're extending that to talk specifically about how big data and knowledge management work together and how data science and artificial intelligence techniques can be used to automate that process that's traditionally been highly, highly manual. So pundits are saying that knowledge management might be one of the areas that uh, is truly transformed through big data, AI, and machine learning. Uh, so that's all what we're going to talk about today. Uh, really exciting to continue to dive into this subject further. So we'll do a very brief overview of what knowledge management is. Um, in 1998, Gartner defined knowledge management as a discipline that promotes an integrated approach to identifying, capturing, evaluating, retrieving, and sharing all of an enterprise's information assets. These assets may include databases, documents, policies, procedures, and previously uncaptured expertise and experience in individual workers. So I wanted to, to start with that and read that because I think that that identification and definition is important. And I think also the fact that it was in 1998 is important. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in our um, uh, uh, presentation here. Uh, we're going to talk about how knowledge management has changed over the years and the scope of current knowledge management capabilities and technologies. This is going to lead us into use cases that are driven by analytics and big data. And then we'll explore a little bit about how uh, companies are trying to uh, experiment and innovate. And so what we are seeing coming up in the future around knowledge management and uh, usage of those uh, techniques. And we will, of course, uh, wrap up with best practices and takeaways. We will monitor the Q&A and the chat section uh, throughout the webinar. And as appropriate, we can take questions uh, within the webinar, and we can also take questions uh, at the end to, uh, to make sure that we can get through as many as possible. Um, 
And today we are going to follow an interview style similar to what we did with uh, George Yuhas in our October webinar. It seemed to go very well, and so we thought we would repeat that again today. So I will be the interviewer. John will be the interviewee. Does that work? Works for mm -hmm. me. Fantastic. Okay. So I started with a definition from Gartner. Uh, in 1998, and uh, knowledge management was a buzzword back then, and uh, was getting a lot of attention from the big consulting companies, the thought leaders. You know, we see Davenport and Prusak on the slide here. So maybe give us a little bit of background on what was happening in, in the 90s and, you know, the early knots, I should say, yeah. uh, and why knowledge management was really um, uh, a buzzword then and, and was getting a lot of attention. Yeah, well, it, and there's, uh, it, it was kind of an offshoot of, of um, understanding the um, upcoming capabilities of large amounts of data and the data warehouse movement was in full force, in fact, was getting ready for uh, an upheaval to a second uh, generation. <clears throat> and um, uh, 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 Ikuro uh, Nonaka, that's uh, the name down there, had written a bunch of uh, uh, seminal works about organizational learning um, and organizations being able to learn and uh, matching up strategy and what you know to what you want to accomplish. Um, uh, uh, Larry Davenport <clears throat> um, took that, um, kind of wrote the seminal uh, um, uh, business version of that of that work. Uh, and and it, it was all around what you know. What don't we know? What should we know? Um, we need to capture it. There, the drivers behind that were were very legitimate. Um, uh, we were starting to see that uh, data volumes were going to become uh, overwhelming. The the first books uh, about uh, how do you deal with lots and lots of data were coming out um, uh, at this time. Um, there was also this uh, understanding that 80% of the content um, that we talked about in, in, in uh, any organization we hadn't addressed at all during the data warehouse movement because it was unstructured. And so that was starting to be kicked around. Um, there was a very deep concern, which has been delayed, but I think is relevant, that a lot of the, as the boomers retire, a lot of expertise is walking out the door. It's been delayed because they've all been hired. They all leave on Friday and they come back in Monday as a consultant. Uh, but um, that is sooner or later that will come home to roost. And then the, the big, the big, uh, I guess the big brass ring is is reusing what you know. Don't try to repeat lessons. Uh, don't climb the same learning curves over and over and over again. Um, so that's where it was all uh, coming from. Um, it was also considered for a little while the next big thing because a lot of money was made off a of data warehouse and BI. Now the next thing, you know, we, we have data, then we got information. So obviously the next thing after information is knowledge and that's going to be a really, really big market as well. So a lot of people paid a lot of attention to this in the late 90s. And that's kind of where uh, it became a, a relatively common word. Great, sorry, searching for my mute button. There we go. Um, awesome. Well then, so knowledge management was really focused on sort of organizational learning and uh, collaboration and uh, pulling information from people's heads and, and trying to uh, get that tacit knowledge. But then um, here we're looking at the, how this has then transitioned into business intelligence. So can you talk a little bit about why business intelligence has become that capability that has extended the use case for knowledge management? Yeah, we're, we're going to cover some of the, some of, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't Larry Davenport, Tom Davenport, Larry Prusak. We're going to cover some of <laughs> Mr. Professor Davenport's reasoning here in a little bit. But when uh, knowledge management uh, burst on the scene, the, the uh, solution area just over human capital, which is capturing what people know and organizations getting smarter, uh, working collaboratively. And as we've said before on a series, collaboration is not the same as cooperation. It is a actual 
learned behavior. Um, and then where is the stuff you know? Um, and then it was, well, BI tells me this much information, but there's so much more possible out there. And of course, even back then, I mean, work I was doing in organizations in the early 90s, we were, we were doing predictive and descriptive analytics. So those, those things aren't new, but we were beginning to see this uh, uh, bright light shining through the cracks, right? And we had the technology to start to bring in unstructured data because the initial ideas and concepts that ended up becoming Hadoop were getting kicked around there. And there were several attempts made at text mining long, long, long before Hadoop uh, and, and uh, multiple uh, format handling came along. Um, the other thing was we the the BI, we were getting reports through data warehouse, we get reports, but we weren't working any better. We were getting better reports, but all of the promised benefits weren't exactly happening. And with some exploration that um, I did and some my peers back then did, we discovered that uh, actionable was a lot more than just delivering a really, really excellent um, excellent scorecard or something like that. You had to actually look ahead and say, how are you going to behave once you get this data? And as you learn more and more about this really excellent data you're supposed to get, how do you keep that inside? And, and a lot of terms were kicked around like collaborative BI and, and things like that. Oh, and that of course means we got to track it management. And then of course, someone says, well, wait a minute, we're going to have an algorithm and that algorithm will say, every time these conditions exist, we do this. So let's close the loop. And well, what we now call um, machine learning and pattern recognition in AI, we recall we were just saying develop closed loop agents back then. Um, but, and it was of course a lot cruder than what we have now. But so that was so, but the technology really, the whole BI world had that stuff in it. So it was really able to go. So this again, that's in our whole topic here. So you can see that there's a natural entry point uh, there's a natural intersection now between knowledge management as we had defined it um, uh, almost ooh, 20 years ago, ouch, and, um, and, uh, and uh, our advanced uh, analytics type technologies. Yeah, and I think I wanted to highlight this concept of uh, you know, identification, tracking, classification, and kind of sorting and pulling together this knowledge, which is one of the really difficult parts of this, right? So it's not just getting the knowledge, it's how do I classify it in a way that it can be consumed and like you said, actioned. Well, we, we're, we're in clients all the time where um, uh, um, um, a big part of data governance that's implemented is, is uh, not doing duplicate reports and duplicate scorecards and duplicating uh, tables and stuff like that. Well, that's because we don't know what we ha what we have, um, and short of some brute force process or procedure, uh, some some extension of what we do in the world of BI gives us technologies that we can now track what we've done and let people uh, 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 access that landscape of of, uh, of 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 information assets. Great. And then if we look at, and we now start going into the future usage of, of where it's headed, um, you know, the, the role of knowledge management was to create this ability or this capability for an organization to establish kind of situational awareness, right? So in yeah. the quote from you here, it's, you know, all those brains, the end of the computer, you know, this collective know-how, it's like it is this situational awareness of doing something within a context and making the right decisions. So how do you see metadata as a critical component of that? Well, um, metadata is, is the critical technology for this. That's the one thing, again, where we have an intersection of, of analytics um, and advanced analytics and artificial intelligence and knowledge management because both of those are meta data driven um, disciplines, right? Um, uh, when you talk about collecting what you know, well, that's metadata. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's the old definition of, of uh, metadata is, is, you know, um, uh, uh, just a, a card catalog, 
type thing, you know, um, and where, where is it? Um, the, 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 the next part of that metadata is, is the term context. And this is where we had to lead in from our September event, right? Graph databases and mm -hmm. being able to have almost an infinite number of relationships to find, but take those two powerful capabilities together. Now I have context. Now I can in, in a crude way, start to overlay this tacit uh, knowledge um, and, and, and relate how things are related. Um, I'm sorry, that was, that was a poor choice of words. Um, connect the dots and create the relationships that are embedded in people's minds. It's still not elegant, uh, but we now have uh, the ability to do that. That is all metadata driven. Um, mm -hmm. As important as the values are in the rows and the columns and the information buried in the documents uh, and the web clicks is, is this information about your information now. That is, and that was the heart and soul of knowledge management. And we'll see here in a minute that might have been an obstacle. And now it is a, in the heart and soul of AI and advanced analytics. And it is, it is totally embraced, right? And no, I don't mm -hmm. think many people argue about that. That's absolutely right. And I think the other thing is we look at the quote on the right hand side uh, and we think about knowledge management and future usage, it's, moving beyond just the internal assets of an organization and looking at external information as well and incorporating external information into the ability to have knowledge. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. 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 It, you know, it, it's, it, 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 you go back to some of the uh, academic works that came out in the eighties and the nineties. And there was this sense that we should be able to really understand what we know. Um, because of all these upcoming, you know, growing infinite, in, seemingly infinite scalability of, of technology. So we should be able to, to, to be smarter about, rather than just, uh, just crudely storing stuff, we should really be able to, to store what we've learned uh, from that. Um, and of course, that means the entire big picture. And any of us, as we go through our daily lives, are an amalgam of concrete facts we know but also impressions and experience of what we've done as we proceed through life. And that's exactly the kind of things we want to capture in an organization as well. So, so, and that's why you need, that's why it's a 360 degree view of everything that influences how anyone does anything. But that sounds kind of hard, John, right? Yes. And, so and, wasn't and, this really hard? <laughs> oh boy, did we get a smack in the face. Uh, yeah. And, uh, some of the reasons we'll find uh, those of us here will 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 um, uh, these will sound familiar. Um, it was too hard to change behavior, uh, uh, you know, the culture change, right? Um, that plagues anything new because people don't like to change, no matter how exotic the concept seems to be. And it it required an awful lot of discipline to change gears and, and, uh, and, and we're, we're gonna see that with AI when, when the machine says go left and everyone else in the room feels they should go right. All right, so um, um, it, 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 the technology, um, everything devolved to technology. And again, we have that problem with uh, um, uh, data science and analytics now where everyone says we can do really cool things with the data and everyone spins up the data science area and a bunch of stuff is cranked out. And if, if you're lucky, um, uh, some of it is, um, well, usually the first initial things show benefit. And if you're lucky, you have sustainable benefit. And if you're not, you have a pretty familiar song that we're hearing a lot lately that it's just not fulfilling any promises. Um, there, at, at the same time this was happening, there was some technologies coming to the forefront that everyone thought had solved the problem at least from an uninformed managerial level, and that was SharePoint and Google. Um, and SharePoint is, a, is an excellent collaborative engine. Um, everyone hammers on poor SharePoint uh, terrifically, but that's just because it's implemented poorly, um, uh, period. Uh, okay, I mean, it, it has a great deal of power that it has features that very few organizations scratch. Um, Google, of course, as you sit down, type in a few words and boom, there's everything you think you need to know about it. So, oh, that's knowledge management. And so that was a big uh, uh, thing there. And then, uh, then there's Google doing this stuff, SharePoint doing us. And at the same time, you're trying to catalog your knowledge 
and the tools that we had that were coming up were really crude and 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 uh, labor intensive. Um, the last thing was, and this is the, this is a hard one, and it kind of closes the loop back to uh, behavior is is when we got things we learned back in the late 90s using crude analytics um, on say smaller data volumes or doing large data volumes but taking literally weeks to process the data sets um, and we came out with big conclusions nobody ever did anything about it all right we they were one-time things um, there's a few examples in aerospace uh, which uh, actually will We'll talk about one here in a little while where we actually did, but very rarely did anybody learn anything and then build it into their business. It just culturally, it just did not happen. So with all of that going on, it just lost uh, interest. So um, uh, uh, Tom Davenport wrote this article in 2015. There are still uh, big organizations that have knowledge management departments. There is still associations out there. There are still knowledge management conferences. There are still a lot of people that believe in this, but it has changed considerably from the academic pursuit that it was and has really realigned itself more along with the technology that can deliver some stuff that we can to start to talk about um, um, embedding in our organizations. And of course, that's the analytics and, and machine learning. So that's kind of how we ended up where we are now. Absolutely. And so then as we look forward, you know, one of the challenges that was identified on the previous slide is that everything devolved into technology. And of course, we saw Google on the previous slide. And so that was kind of how knowledge management had uh, was was difficult and one of the challenges that needed to be overcome. Well, here on this slide is a slide of talking about, um, you know, technology again. And of yes. course, Google is is in the forefront. So. Um, What's different now? So what's actually changed so that yeah. this technology landscape can actually make an impact on uh, uh, knowledge management? Well, it's really interesting. As I was doing the research for this, I couldn't find any of the, I went through and found some old notes from uh, the late 90s and early 2s and some old presentations I'd done. And none of the vendors uh, I mentioned in any of those were in existence or had been absorbed into other technologies. Um, um, so we have a whole new cast of characters, but if you take a look at this cast, the characters, and you take a look at what we've been talking about in the series for the last couple of years, you'll see some familiar names because a lot of the really cool ideas, which is, you know, going through the, 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 the analytics and then capturing, uh, uh, using machine learning to detect the pattern and training some type of repetitive behavior is in fact uh, some type of organizational learning well and then of course we need the metadata to go with that um, and we need uh, the collaborative tools and we need to manage the unstructured content and the digital content as well um, so we've got uh, uh, again none of these i would say you can't say i go out i'm going to go out and buy an integrated knowledge management suite that doesn't exist but we you have an awful lot pointing in that direction right now because now do you want to say well uh, we have an ai program uh, we're doing big data and analytics um and uh um we don't have all the we don't have all the popularity we had three years ago when it was the the next big thing uh so we're going to call it knowledge management and it'll be the next big thing again i i don't think you i don't think that's a brand that is is worth your trouble but I think you do have an awful lot of technology pointing in the right direction where you've got, you know, Calibra with really good solid. I put Calibra there because it's really good workflow. People actually have to use this to manage their, to manage what they know about what they know, their metadata. And Alation uses AI and Watson and OpenCV are really, really smart uh, learning um, uh, technologies that will tell you what you need to do without any human intervention uh, whatsoever. And then, of course, you have to manage it all there with all the different uh, types of technologies. And we've got some examples there uh, as well. And, of course, the other examples for document and content management that um, are all connected. If you take a look at, say, Confluence, which is in the, the JIRA, Confluence, Agile universe, you go, wow, 
there's all kinds of workflow around technology that we're working on now. And all of this is being captured. All of, the, all of these technologies allow you to capture your interactions and build enormous databases of, of work of, and, and that you can actually study how you did your work as well as the data that was produced by the work. So we're really getting close. Um, it's, still, it's still quite a, quite a collection, um, but, but a boy is it a lot more powerful than it was um, when we first started to dip our toe in the water with this. Got it. So then what's changing is that it's not, it, the technology now supports the process in a much better way that in fact yeah. is optimizing the manual processes um, through things like, you know, AI, machine learning, linguistic analysis, for example. Um, oh, yeah. And knowledge graphs, right? What we talked oh. about in, in uh, September. Uh, I, I looked at my first graph database in 2001 or 2002 and I went, wow, this is really great. But it couldn't hold more than uh, a few thousand relationships before it was so slow that you mm -hmm. couldn't, uh, which is <laughs> just like relational was in 1984. All right. Um, uh, it, you know, that just, we weren't ready. Um, uh, I participated in a business venture in 1998 or 99, where we tried to develop a collaborative tool that collected work and, and we couldn't find uh, anything to hold all the data. It was just we, we overnight we overwhelmed ourselves with the amount of data we were we were there we couldn't handle it so you know uh, our brains were 20 years ahead of our capabilities but now the like, capabilities are there so a lot of right. what you might have kicked around back then you can really get serious about this stuff now right and so you know Google is using knowledge graphs and text mining and machine learning oh, for you know yeah. translation services and speech recognition image recognition and you know things like that that I think we're starting to take advantage um, uh, as just a, a given um, but, oh, well, you know, I, yeah. the cool technology this just popped into my head Kelly it is um, I, I, I thought it was science fiction. I thought it was a joke, but there is actually a little Bluetooth device that you stick in your ear and it translates a conversation in another language. Mm -hmm. okay. Now that came from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It was called the Babblefish, right? And I, right. I, that might be what the technology is called. I don't know. Um, I'm not in marketing, but um, uh, that power, that, that, that absolute raw power is what we need, was what you need for this, and we've got it. So now it's like, what do we do with it? How do we go yeah. forward? Right. So let's let's talk about the how, right? So we've been talking about the what. We've been talk talking about, um, you know, the history. So now let's talk about the how and let's explore some of the use cases for analytics and big data that are specific to knowledge management. And let's talk specifically about how how AI and machine learning can automate these, you know, two of the biggest challenges that we talked about before, which is, um, well, the challenges that impeded the widespread adoption. And those challenges were things like extracting and uh, categorizing and representing the knowledge, right? So we had talked about that in the previous slide in terms of the classification, um, getting it out of people's heads through the understanding of problems. So what are we seeing now then in terms of leveraging big data to do that for us, if you will? Well, uh, when you're talk about, starting to talk about practical use cases and big data, one thing you got to, you know, obviously, you're dealing with uh, all kinds of different formats and different types of content. Um, and what you need to though, understand, it's not just it's a big lump of stuff in the lake, all right? That, that can get you into trouble. Um, the first thing you need to do is understand uh, the spectrum of where content's coming from. Um, and you're looking at our little chart there. Content goes from individual content, um, things we do with our personal knowledge bases, our calendars, our personal spreadsheets, things like that. Then it goes all the way to global, universal, community type content. Um, and there's different layers of structure and complexity within that too. And if you're going to start to say, well, the technology's pretty cool, I'm gonna go after this, you first of all have to have this picture in your head, all right? Um, uh, you have to understand how you're gonna get visibility across all these categories, classifications, nooks and crannies uh, of data. Um, you're gonna be looking at external stuff that's uh, competitive intelligence, public knowledge bases, knowledge bases, 
such as a library, which has been you know, a public knowledge base for thousands of years. There are all kinds of systems and things. And then there's that human capital, which is your tacit knowledge, that you still have to figure a way to, to, to put the veneer of human experience on top of this as well. Now, AI will, to a certain extent, start to replicate that type of learning because machine learning will you know, look at the patterns and you'll, you'll build um, repeatable models and things like that. Um, so that gives you a use case for knowledge management in that using AI and all these technologies to process all these massive varieties of content now gives you um, a, a case for quote unquote uh, knowledge management. Um, uh, we're going to talk about here um, soon though, this AI, there's a hook here with the AI, right? You know, is, is AI and machine learning going to replace tacit knowledge or supplement it? Um, and, and if not supplement it, how do we capture it? So those are some of the things that the use cases have to deal with as well. Well, actually a question came in that I thought was really good. Maybe we can take it here. Uh, so in terms of of AI using uh, the information to uh, make sense out of this implicit and tacit knowledge. Um, the question is, does knowledge management require some good data stewards that really know the data? So how does this concept of quality come into leveraging AI for knowledge management? Yeah, um, it, it, there's a sideways answer to that. Uh, data quality is really important for AI to be correct. Um, um, we are overlooking, uh, and it's, that's just the scary part of AI, we're overlooking the fact that a, a machine learning fed bad data will come up with uh, a Frankenstein recommendation, um, and it will not be what you want your organization to do. Data quality is extremely important. Um, so from that standpoint, you need to somehow be able to get the data quality to the appropriate uh, position that a, a learning model can utilize it. And that means removing all the bias out of it. We're not just talking about fat fingered numbers. We're talking about built in bias, cultural bias in data, because that bias will come out on the other side of the AI. So that's where some type of uh, 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 human awareness and uh, ability to, to uh, correct that goes, uh, comes to bear. The specific question about requiring a data steward that really know the data, you're not going to like the answer. The answer to that one is the reason KM came around is we thought that was a way to shortcut having so many smart people having to know so much about the data. There's a certain twisted evil purpose to KM, which was get rid of this, this uh, embedded department expert on everything. We, we, we were relying on them too much. So, so when you say know the data, you got to define what is it about the data you need to know. Uh, quality, um, contextual type uh, um, behaviors of the data, but from a caretaking standpoint and, and, oh, you want this data, I know where it is, or you want that data, I know where that data is too. Those are two different things. The latter example where, where someone has the, the data landscape in their head, we're trying to get rid of that. KM is explicitly trying to get rid of that, but we still need what's in between people's ears because someone knows that, well, on fourth quarter, that number is never really accurate because it's some end of the year issue or something like that. That's the stuff that we don't know. And that's for some type of, of expertise or subject matter experts important. Why I would call that a steward or not is up to debate, but that's how, that, that's how I answer that question. I, I could go on for that one. That's a good question. I could go for two hours. <laughs> That'll be another webinar. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And then there was also a, a comment on the previous slide to mention other technologies such as Alteryx. And, and I guess I should preface that previous slide to say that that's not meant to be comprehensive. It was meant to be representative and yeah. to call out some of the, the names that we're seeing as leaders in each of the spaces. Alteryx uh, absolutely is a leader within that space as well. So the yeah, idea absolutely. was to just kind of pepper pepper the technologies well what we're um, trying to do is show the bi and analytics stuff how it's pushing in and there is km like alterix is a km exclusive tool but uh, we we didn't have time to get into that one so that's that's a good comment yes yeah absolutely and then as we look at uh you know moving into uh these use cases 
sciences and today's mm -hmm. knowledge extraction using you know machine learning linguistics analysis it's actually becoming cheaper and uh you know a more broadly used mechanism to capture some of that domain expertise that you were just yep. talking about to yeah. kind of capture yeah. the the expert knowledge you know departmental expert knowledge um, but I think the other thing that that comes up here is this sort of continuum and the fact that the data is generated on a regular basis too so that the, you've got all of this data feeding into the potential for AI and machine learning on a regular basis versus something that's choppy uh, yeah. in the past. Oh, yeah, yeah. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, you've kind of got the uh, hierarchy of needs here on the right. You've got to have a well-managed data supply chain, absolutely first and foremost for any use case for this. Then you apply the AI and machine learning is a subset of of AI and when all of that happens now you can start to talk about knowledge management understanding how I and it kind of ties back to this question that that was submitted here that you need to take to heart what people know about that 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 data all right um, it could be that there are um, data quality usefulness issues that aren't able to be detected by any type of model. There, there are data movement or contextual issues, um, like a seasonality example I mentioned, that affect uh, the results. So you still need to apply what people already know. I, um, maybe I'm being um, a stick in the mud on that, and there's some PhD in AI out there saying, I'm going to eliminate people altogether, fine and dandy, but right now, not a chance, okay, just, just not a chance. Um, so what's tacit? Where, where is that tacit knowledge and where is it important? And then everything else still needs to be accessible, navigable, and contextual. You just can't spit out the result of, of, a, of, a, of a machine learning pattern recognition and say this is gospel and make it so. Um, people need to be able to look at it, understand it, understand its effects, and understand the context that that model was generated within. And if, if, you, if you behave yourself along all those way, you are getting now up this ladder, you are getting into knowledge management, which is, you know, that's pretty cool stuff. Right, so the idea of big data and data science has given us some tools to get us, you know, a little bit further up that ladder, if you will, and we can leverage the ability to uh, identify, classify uh, information in an organized way via AI and machine learning, but applying the contextual analysis around it is still one of these more sort of human intervention uh, requirements. So it's helping us along that chain. Okay, well, let's, let's as we dive into this how, oh, this is uh, one of my favorite slides here. Um, John, this is a great representation that you put together to show, you know, really what does this look like and how does this fit into, um, you know, a process and, and how, you know, how do we go through this? So maybe, John, why don't you walk us through this? Because I think that this is a really great way to make it real for the, the folks on the webinar here. Yeah, so, um, You've got big data, and so that's the big disk symbol over there. And, and it has subsets within it. You've got structured data, which we call data, and content, which might be a digital media or a document or an email or, or something like that. And um, uh, uh, starting from the top and working our way down to the bottom, um, uh, it, it, the, the, the beginning of this was you, you have your data, you do BI and reporting, you look at the report, you know what it means, the person, the individual knows the context. Uh, from this, I get new information and new experiences, and that needs to go into the future knowledge base. I need to store an insight as to what happened in response to the information and enable the action. So I need to capture the work that happened as a result of this BI and report output. I need to, those arrows going into the knowledge base need to be, it's a new type, so I say it's new information. It's not 
what's on the report or the scorecard. It's, it's a combination of what I've done with the report and recordings of the action I took. For example, if I have a workflow engine and I have a report, I, I say, hey, look at this number, and it goes to the workflow, and, and then someone else says, oh my, that's quite the number, and then the workflow, and as always tracked and traced. Any massive help desk software is a perfect example of, of, of that type of uh, metaphor. Now, we take uh, the bottom thing, we have content, and very, very similar, we, we do analytics on the unstructured. We used to be called text mining or something like that, now we just use analytics, and we have the same meaning and context, but we, because we've got um, uh, uh, um, already, the stuff is already going through an algorithm, I can actually tag it now, because I, because of the document it's in, I can actually get some sense of knowledge and learning from that. But I also will have this new information because someone's going to use the result of that text analysis or studying the web clicks or something and, and do something. And we'll, you know, we've got to put that somewhere as well. Uh, then, of course, in the middle is our new world of, of advanced analytics or relatively new. It becomes brand new insight. Wow, we didn't know this before that every time that, you know, the sun comes up over here, this happens over there. All right, so I have you know new context and new information that I have to, and I use the word ascribe because um, um, that's the right word for it, the meaning and context of these new insights. And because they're algorithmic, I can tag them and I can take the experience from the work we're doing with that and I can load that into the knowledge base as well. So the, the, the ultimate output, the brass ring is, is insight and that can be accessed then through a knowledge map. And I have a very crude um, uh, image of a knowledge map and there was no intent for that to look like mouse's ears. I really, I just noticed that and I just didn't, there's no intent there at all. Um, That's funny. <laughs> so if we, if we take an example, um, uh, like kind of a managing uh, human capital, human interaction, managing work, all right? So we're in a mm -hmm. very sophisticated organization, Kelly, and we're doing um, it's a work that uh, First San Francisco is familiar with is a product management, product MDM. And there's a lot of uh, work that goes in creating a new product, creating the packaging around the new product, and it happens again and again and again in a sophisticated consumer products company, right? So, um, and uh, what often happens is they do a really great product launch and then two years later they have another one and guess what? Can you guess what happens, Kelly? They, they lose all the information <laughs> that they learned in the process. They have to do it all over again. And someone says, upstairs, looking at this cost of launching a new product, goes, what the heck? I'm going to start a knowledge management project. And that's how you know, some of this got started. And we're going to capture the way everyone works. So as products are set up, we go with something that's maybe more collaborative. And there are specific software products now that are intersect with workflow with product uh, management um, and you build a metadata layer there so um, uh, I have my uh, emails and stuff so that's my content I can analyze I have maybe external data from marketing on what products work and what don't and activities on the website and things like that so I can do some some blended analytics there and come out with some new insights on products and then I can just do some plain old grinding what sold last year what didn't sell last year et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. all of this goes into that knowledge knowledge base and i can uh using analytics and using the insights of ai and stuff like that i can start to put some ideas together like if you do this product this way at this time of year it probably won't sell too well all right um, or if you don't get this product out in a certain amount of time you probably won't sell as many as you wanted to sell um, and at some point in time, this type of structure and this type of knowledge base you build allows you to do that closed loop agent, we used to call it. But it's really a machine learning um, uh, um, AI taking over a, a decision point in your business and taking over a business process where you start to say, well, based on all this data and all these patterns, um, this product is an awful lot like a product we did five years ago. 
um, here is the workflow for that product. Uh, I recommend that we do the product this way. Um, or somebody is going to new, do a new product and they sit down and type in, we're going to do a new product and it's kind of like this and kind of like that. And the AI matches that up with the old workflows and finds something similar based on all this data and uh, research that it's got and recommends a pro actually recommends a process for move this, to move this new product to market. That's how this type of uh, running all these, uh, what we used to think of as distinct paths, data, big data, and content uh, together and, 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 and then dumping that into the knowledge base. And remember what's also in this content and also there in terms of, of experience on a couple of those lines is, is tracking what people are actually doing and how they're interacting with various systems and measuring their actual work. That's all going into the knowledge base too. And you get all that in one big pile and wow, you can do really awesome things with that. Absolutely. And so if we think, so this is kind of a process lens. If we think about it as an architecture lens, and yeah. look at and our um, reference architecture here, that knowledge base is really what we're seeing on the right-hand side represented as a knowledge lake or even a knowledge graph, right? Isn't that how we're kind of viewing it yeah. here? It's, it's uh, kind of uh, the circle and like you had indicated, the closed loop where you're also using uh, it's not only pulling the data from a big data environment, but it's also using the big data to be that that knowledge lake, not just the data lake. Absolutely. The, the knowledge lake is, is, if you think a data lake is sophisticated, and, and really it isn't, it's just a big place you put stuff. Um, but the knowledge lake is, has um, a lot more um, agents in it, and it, it has those things you've learned and those behaviors and those responses and basically rules are created to respond to certain uh, scenarios. The knowledge graph is again using graph technology and um, hyperbolic trees and all those cool interfaces this stuff has uh, is how I would navigate that. Because remember if I'm a user that I need to find stuff on both sides of the lake and I might want to look at source documents and I might want to drill all the way back to data sources. I might want to drill all the way back to the old ERP system on the vintage side of this thing too. Hence the red box, the abstraction engine. Um, and, and this is something that is not on our normal uh, uh, reference architecture. Um, uh, but that's, that is an arbitrator and a translator between what is structured, unstructured, explicit knowledge, and then uh, positions it in such a way to make it useful to the AI. Um, because uh, again, um, if you just take the raw data and, and you just push it into the AI, you're likely to in, induce bias into those models and, and you've got to have some way to, to balance uh, that out. Also notice we have some things appearing on the vintage side and that is work. People are still doing work on the vintage side, but now we're going to try to actual capture vintage work, especially if they're doing it on an intranet um, you know, and uh, um, doing web stuff, web technologies, then we can capture that work. Also, collaboration now enters as a formal technology to use data. And instead of just output in data usage, I now have the actual work being done on the data and capturing actual work. So there's a lot of extra things coming into your architecture here. But, you know, is anyone to throw the switch and do this tomorrow? Probably not, but this is a bit of a target uh, if you're starting to think about these things. Um, uh, um, yeah, you know. and metadata comes back into play here, right? Oh. So we talked, we started the conversation yeah. in the in the beginning about how metadata is a critical component. So, so maybe also talk about how metadata fits into this too, John. Well, um, you know, we were drawing a slide, and I was working on it. And I didn't know what I have two metadata, an old metadata, and a new metadata. But really, it, it's not. Don't let one red box indicate that it's one metadata product there. This is a metadata capability, right? I think that's probably the right word for it. And it is a capability of, of knowing where everything is, who touches everything, what is the context of things. Um, it, is, it, is the, it, is, it is the driving engine. It is the heart of, of, of all your data and content management uh, for an architecture uh, like this. In fact, it, it should be so ubiquitous at some point in time that we don't even talk about it. 
it, it, you know, it's when we get into a car, we know that when we turn the key, this thing under the hood called an engine does something. But cars are getting to the point now where we don't really care whether that was a hybrid or gas or diesel or all electric. We just turn the key or push a button and we go. And at some point in time, metadata is going to be like that. It's going to be the engine that drives all of this and it's it will be invisible. But for now, um, you know, you're going to be blending several products to get those capabilities. Absolutely. And it needs to be explicit. And so now, as we start to wrap up, we want to make sure that we're sensitive to time here. Yeah. But let's look at how this fits into the operating framework. And so, again, kind of circling back to some of the slides that we saw in the beginning, where we looked at how knowledge management enabled certain aspects of the organization. Um, and, and then we talked about what's changed in knowledge management. So as we circle back, now what's new about these supporting programs on the right-hand side and, and the way that it can support things like human capital? Yeah, and, and I'll go through this one pretty quickly. Basically, what, when, and I, when I, I look across areas that say they're doing knowledge management or doing something like KM and not calling it that, they're supporting uh, innovative efforts and trying to remember how they are innovative. How do we, how do we be innovative? They're trying to capture those smarts and there's lots of cool things happening there to do that and y'all can read that all right and then there's they're also supporting uh, conventional efforts which might be more complicated um, uh, really really large uh, in terms of uh, impact to the organization content um, uh, or disruption um, and I put like a disruptive regulation like GDPR uh, is a classic uh, thing where a KM department, if it was in place, could really help in an organization. But but um, KM areas, and I call it areas because I can't really find a place where they, they live. Um, uh, I can't find a consistent place where you can say KM always is under this the, the CIO or always under human capital, or they're, they're all over the place, is, is innovation projects uh, basically offer a service to help you manage your large initiative offer you a service for content management and content tagging, offer a service for searching for things, kind of an internal Google, or offer services for finding the expertise to help you with your project. We know what we know. We're gonna let you find out where it is so you don't have to go find it yourself. And all, the, all this interacts with all these supporting programs on the right. You've got your basic enterprise architecture, data process, and your capability architectures. And everyone can read all these other type of organizations. And the big one at the top is organization change. Again, if you know, there was a question here that came through, I just complain about um, how, you know, influencing behaviors. Uh, the, the, it killed KM, it kills governance, it kills MDM, it kills EIM. Uh, the culture, the, the, the soft issues are really important on that. And that's kind of a nice, uh, that's a very abstract view of an operating framework. Okay, absolutely. So we're going to wrap up here and yeah. just start to summarize that, you know, ultimately this is about supporting organizational learning and the human capital development. We saw this slide back in September. Yeah. Um, but Bill, you know, this slide is the, the net new right and uh, what's yeah. available now uh, based on the technologies that are available to do some of this uh, very um, sophisticated analysis and uh, did you, you want to add anything to this slide if not we can go to our uh, the, uh, yeah. the, the question mark is what do you do with what you've learned um, that is the real cultural aspect you know until human beings become cyborgs there's going to be something between somebody's ears that's really important um, and how do you, how, you know, how do you manage that? And that, that's, that's key. And that's the $64 billion question. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. So if we then go into, well, how do we take advantage of this uh, from, uh, you know, because we aren't yet cyborgs and um, we talk about how to make this work within your organization. So most of the companies that are on the phone have probably started to head down a data science path. Some people have uh, jumped into the lake 100% and some are just dipping their toes into the data lake. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, as you have gone down this path to take a look at what you're doing and see if you can leverage some of those uh, data science techniques for knowledge management also. So for example, if you are doing linguistics analysis somewhere else in your data science organization, could that be applied to an internal process that generates knowledge. For example, 
uh, this is being done in decision support um, systems or, you know, trouble ticketing in IT systems. Mm -hmm. So can you apply linguistics analysis to support calls and therefore improve the self-service component of your IT help desk? Um, what else are you seeing that's become practical from this perspective, John? Yeah, I mean, and there are some good examples that have been around for years. Uh, anyone who watches television sees the little commercial where Watson is in the elevator and Watson says, you got to fix the elevator because it's going to break in two days, right? Um, that is a uh, mean time between failure analysis that's been going on in complex aerospace and the military for, for decades. Um, uh, it is sophisticated statistical analysis. It's a lot of number crunching. Uh, but as a classic example of learning from things and then uh, adjusting behaviors in the organization and closing the loop because you're telling someone to replace a perfectly good operational part, but it saves you a ton of money when you do that. So that's, a, that's, that's one really good example. You mentioned help desks, uh, also healthcare, obviously, drug interactions, uh, things like that. Uh, those are things that are going now. Uh, there's a, so there are organizations that absolutely require knowledge management, whether they call it that or not. So, but anyone in any organization can find something to benefit. If you're talking data science and you're starting to whisper AI, you need to study this topic. Absolutely. And so uh, just a reminder to get those questions in, and we're going to go to our final slide of our key takeaways. Yep. Um, so essentially, you know, and this is a theme that you always hear from uh, John and I, is this, this pragmatism. And so leveraging big data and analytics and AI to create this pragmatic gateway to knowledge management. So leverage what you're already doing in your analysis process. Uh, leverage the data that exists in the lake already and see if there's a way you can apply it internally to improve the understanding of processes and, and the efficiency of processes. Mm -hmm. um, so John, why don't you also go through and highlight a couple of these as well? well the learning organization uh, as academically presented in the 80s is a long way off. Um, uh, luckily, I'm one of the folks that I am worried about AI. Um, HAL is a long way off. And if you're a young person and don't know who HAL is, just ask the old person next to you, next cubicle over. Um, uh, I think it's a long way off still, but, but it doesn't mean that AI isn't beneficial and useful right now. It is a tremendous supplement to what people know. It is a, it is a foil. So uh, Bob over here in the corner says, we got to go this way, but the model says we got to go this way. That is powerful in its own right, having those two options in front of you. So again, we're far away from knowledge management and the pure academic view. Um, and not so much as a department or a program or a system. I view this now more of as a capability that the entire organization moves towards uh, the same way that in its ideal sense, data governance is a capability that should be embedded and go away as a separate type area. So um, uh, um, those, are, those are some of the um, uh, takeaways there. We got a couple more questions came in here. Can I want you to read one? I want one just popped in and we'll take a run at that. Yeah, one. absolutely. And I think this is a really interesting question. So this one is, uh, how do we represent knowledge? Yeah. Any standards or reference architecture? Yes, there is a standard. Maybe, yeah. Okay. Go for it, John. It's called the Dublin Core. Aha. Uh -huh. And well, people, go, people go, what's that? Have you ever been to a library? You see those numbers on the side of the books, that is a knowledge standard of how to categorize and find knowledge. It's called the Dewey Decimal System. And a lot of people don't know this, but the Dewey Decimal System is licensed proprietary intellectual property. Uh, and every library in the country pays for it. Um, and it is the first knowledge management product. I, it goes back to the 19th century. And it is still a standard reference architecture for finding stuff topical. So that's the first thing. And of course, the other thing is the OMG years ago, and I don't, is the OMG still around, Kelly? Object Management Group? I think so. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, they, they, had, they had many, many, many uh, expressions of, of other knowledge reference models. Um, uh, that were based on uh, industry data models, and then uh, uh, they applied some XML 
type stuff to them and have since applied some other um, uh, graph type concepts to them. And uh, those are sitting around out there. Is there one that everyone's going to use like UML or or, or something like that. No, um, there isn't. Um, uh, um, um, I suspect sometime in the next, I'd say, I'd say, well, we have a trends talk next, next month. And one of the trends we're going to talk about is what this might look like in a year or two. Um, something's going to happen there, but uh, um, there isn't one. Yeah. Yeah. Double That's core right. really cool. Right. Double core can be reviewed uh -huh. on the website. It's very, very cool. You'll re look at it and you go, dang, that is really neat. It's very, very cool. Yeah. So we've provided a reference architecture on how some of these repositories, if you will, could yeah. fit together. Um, but there really isn't a metadata standard for knowledge at this moment. So there's lots of different metadata standards mm -hmm. and, and definitional standards and you know ontology standards and things like that. But it, it, from what we've seen, it hasn't quite yet made its way to knowledge management. And yeah, I think you, with that, we are at the top of the hour, are we? Yeah, we are. I just want to say, if you're diving into this area, one other thing to study is ontologies and taxonomies. Mm -hmm. Those will help you a great deal. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Shannon, to you. Thank, thank you. you, Kelly. Thank you, John. As always, another great presentation. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the questions that have come in uh, for this session. And just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides and links to the recording. Again, thanks, everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Take care.